After an All-NBA First Team campaign, Shea Gilgis Alexander has completely leveled up once again. Right now, he's joining Michael Jordan as just the second player in NBA history to average at least 30 points and two steals while shooting 50% from the field, and each one of those marks is being absolutely crushed. With that box score, the Thunder are the one seed out west and have the second best record overall leaving many wondering just how good Shea is on both ends of the floor and whether or not he should take home this year's MVP. I think the most underrated aspect of his game is that he's one of the fastest players in the league and he's always looking for opportunities to leak out and run the floor. He pairs that speed with incredible length, which is a great combination to have in the open floor as he strides his way into some easy buckets. In addition to the physical tools, he's really quick to process defenses, meaning that even if they appear to be setting into good position, he'll redirect and hunt for a new lane where he's pretty much guaranteed to finish. In the rare event that there truly isn't a pathway for him to get to the rim, that's when you'll see him utilize the mid-range. And when the entire package comes together, you're left with arguably the best transition scorer in the league right now. He's second in the NBA at 7.5 points per game and generating an incredibly efficient 1.27 points per possession. That sort of production rivals the best of the best, and of course the pressure that he's able to apply as a fast break scorer will often demand added attention, to which he'll find one of his streaking teammates for some easy offense of their own. It's not just in the open floor where Shea's applying constant pressure though. Anytime he has an opportunity to drive early in offensive possessions, even against a perfectly set defense, he's taking advantage. And when I say he's in non-stop attack mode, I mean that literally. He's leading the NBA in drives by a landslide at 24 a game, but it's the rate at which he's converting as a scorer that really stands out to me. Here's a look at the scoring volume and efficiency of every player averaging at least 5 points a game off drives. And here's where Shea lands, not just an outlier in how much he scores, but doing so while remaining one of the most efficient. Instead of sheer speed, like in transition, it's more about how quickly he can shift gears to beat defenders off the dribble. His ability to start and stop on a dime is as good as it gets, and he'll weaponize that explosive burst with the use of his handle. You never know if he's going to drive left or right, and by the time he's taken that first step, it's too late to react. Here's one where he pauses while going behind his back, and with one dribble to his right he sees an opportunity, making Brooks look like a traffic cone on his way to a layup. Because it all happens so quickly, and that first step can be taken in either direction, sometimes it's just a simple hesitation doing the trick. With a second defender glued to his left hip, you'd think he would want to attack right, but by crossing back to his left he gets the step, which is all he needs for a lengthy finish. Here's another example, he's sort of lightly jogging down the court then out of nowhere turns on the Jets to blow right by Claxton, and right about here you could see that this was ending in a layup. The thing with Shea though, is that it's not just about the initial acceleration, but also the deceleration, as he slams the brakes to force contact from behind. That ability to stop so suddenly really helps him as a finisher. All he needs is a defender on his hip, because once they both have momentum going towards the baseline, when he weaponizes that deceleration they're gonna fly by, leaving him with an angle to kiss it off the glass. He's an absolutely incredible interior scorer. But real quick before we get into that, I want to give a huge shout out to DraftKings for sponsoring this video. We're rapidly approaching the NBA playoffs, and if you're looking for a place to get in on the action, look no further than the DraftKings Pick 6 app, a brand new way to play daily fantasy. With DraftKings Pick 6, all new customers get a deposit match of 100% of up to $100, with a deposit of just 5 or more. That's right, if you deposit anywhere from $5 to $100, DraftKings Pick 6 will match it in credits and getting started is about as easy as it gets. All you have to do is download the app and sign up using code HOOPVENUE. Then you can select anywhere from 2-6 to six basketball players and choose if they're going to have more or less of any stat. From there you sit back, watch your lineup, and compete against others for a chance to win some huge prizes. One more time, that's code HOOPVENUE in all caps at the DraftKings Pick 6 app, for a 100% deposit match of up to 
With that said, let's take a look at Shea's ability to score around the rim. If he's even just half an inch by his defender, that length will give him an angle to finish. This one starts with that initial change of pace as he fakes a crossover before driving left, and although it looks like Tate does a good job of defending, as soon as one stride is by his hip, the possession is as good as over. Even when it feels like there's no possible way for him to access a layup, he'll just create one out of thin air. After beating Gobert off the dribble, he finds himself underneath the backboard, but with a quick leap and an extended arm, he's got two points. The way he weaponizes his length also adds a ton of different counters to his actual driving game. First you have the initial burst to beat his man, then when a second defender comes he can make himself skinny with an exaggerated gather step to sneak right by. Or how about a play like this where he tries to drive right but gets cut off and spins back to his left, where two big strides take him to the opposite side of the paint for a lay. Another thing that helps Shea when he gets cut off is his strength. He's got a really sturdy core and has mastered the use of his inside shoulder to go right through smaller defenders, where that length of course takes care of the rest. Here's another example. He bursts into a drive right, but Suggs plays it perfectly, so he drops the shoulder into his chest while stepping back, which leaves him with room to set up a jumper. Every single physical tool I talked about in his driving also helps him create opportunities in the mid-range. You've got the shoulder bump as he stops on a dime, with a little help from some of the most flexible ankles you'll ever see, and just look at how much separation he creates. That might as well be a practice shot. That simple change of speed gives him unlimited access to this area of the floor. The initial burst as he crosses over catches Beal completely off balance, then by immediately pumping the brakes, it's a virtually uncontested jumper. Or how about one where he actually beats his man off the dribble with ease, and before the help can ever meet him, he's already stopping and popping from about 10 feet. On the season, Shea's attempting just under 11 mid-range shots every 75 possessions, 5th in the NBA, and he's hitting almost 51% of them. The only other guy matching his efficiency on at least 10 attempts is Kevin Durant, so I think he's in pretty good territory. And the key here is that his use of the in-between game gives him an option to always fall back on when his drives get taken away. Early help at the nail? He'll use his elite handle to get back to his right hand and take advantage of space near the elbow. The defense is in his own, with a second defender sitting on the block. Again, it's the handle as he crosses into a sidestep to create an open look. At times, it feels like he's almost immune to help defense. Here's one where he beats his man on a drive and runs into a second defender, only to stop on a dime and turn into a fadeaway jumper. Here's another example. He easily blows by his defender, but a 7-footer is waiting under the basket to meet him, so he shifts all of his momentum into a pullback before rising up for 2 points plus a foul. That pullback is probably Shea's most vicious move. The deceleration, paired with both his length and overall flexibility, allows him to generate a ton of space in just a fraction of a second. And he won't just go to these as a way to create jumpers. Here's another one that starts with the drive and pullback, but this time he keeps his dribble live and shows off that burst as he gets to a layup. Plays like these really speak to how while his slashing does open up the midrange, that works both ways. Once again, it's that pullback, but now he's going to gather, throw an up fake, and step through for a soft touch finger roll. This is yet another move in his bag that's made possible by length. Against Gobert, he tries a step back, but doesn't create any space, only to step through and finish with the inside hand, all while making it look way too easy. These step backs are his go-to out on the perimeter as well. He especially likes this left hand pound dribble as he steps back. Most of his scoring is done inside the arc, but he'll occasionally go to the three ball, and he's an absolutely absurd space creator, so these are usually decent looks. On the season, he's attempting two and a half pull-up threes a game, so like I said, it isn't necessarily a go-to, but he's hit 40% of them. So we're talking about a guy who's capitalizing when the opportunity arises. The overall product is this seemingly unguardable isolation scorer. Whether it's in early offense, from a standstill, he's applying constant pressure on the rim where he can finish in a variety of ways. If his initial driving lane gets taken away, he's either got counters to create a new one or utilize the mid-range where he's shooting near league best percentages. 
and if he has too much room, he'll occasionally utilize the three ball at a decent clip. When that all comes together, you're left with a guy who's second in the NBA at 7 points a game in isolation on an absurd 1.15 points per possession, good enough to land him in the 90th percentile. Obviously, one-on-one -on -one scoring with that level of volume and efficiency demands added attention, and Shea's got some really nice playmaking chops. Most of his creation comes as a result of his ability to pressure the rim. The decisions seem simple. Drive, draw help, and find the open shooter. And it all comes down to how well he both reads and times up helping defenders. Take this play. He drives left counter spins back to his right, and while mid-spin, recognizes that both rim protectors have sunk, so he throws a bullet pass to Lou Dort, who's got all the time in the world to set for a three. Here's another one. You've got the initial burst, nail help comes, so he does what any normal ball handler would do and nutmegs him without breaking stride, then sets up as if looking for a jumper before dropping it off to a wide open cutter. I know you're running to the comments, so I'll say it before you do. No, that through the legs dribble move was not intentional. However, it does speak to how in control of the ball he is. That handle is just absurd. Despite having a near 7 foot wingspan, it's always on a string, and he's comfortable keeping it alive through even the tightest quarters. When you pair that with low risk, low error playmaking, you get a guy who quite literally never turns the ball over. Right now, he's averaging about two a game, which relative to how much offense he creates with the ball is almost laughable. The playmaking and ball security, when paired with Shea's surgical inside the arc scoring, has turned him into an elite pick and roll operator. When met with drop coverage, he can use his speed to attack space, throwing all of his momentum into a drive before decelerating to set up a finish. And if the big sits back a little bit too far on that drop to protect the paint, he's got access to the automatic pull-up jumper. When needed, he can also play a more methodical game, slowing down to put his defender in jail and utilizing that in-between space to slowly work his way to the rim. Sometimes what teams will do to close that space is bring their big up to the level, except that just puts them in a more vulnerable position to be attacked in space. And if they decide to blitz to get the ball out of his hands, he can make that shovel pass to a slipping roller, creating some more easy offense. If a defense is feeling real spicy, they might even pull out the switch card. And when that happens, well, you're right back to dealing with that incredibly efficient one-on-one -on -one scoring. On OKC side of things, sometimes instead of a traditional pick and roll, they'll use their guards as the screeners, especially when it's a shooter like Isaiah Joe and that second defender shows to the ball. It's a quick and easy way to create an open three. Here's another one where they appear to be setting up that exact same action, and he sort of lulls his defender to sleep before taking off with that jarring change of pace on his way to a layup. This season, Shea's averaging 9 points a game in the pick and roll, 9th in the NBA, and again it's on amazing efficiency, 1.14 points per possession. Now we're talking about some absolutely ridiculous on-ball perimeter scoring. That's not it though, Shea can also play with his back to the basket. The Thunder will set him up on an open side where he's got a ton of different scoring counters. He can turn over his right shoulder for a fadeaway jumper or he can fake that right shoulder turn with a little shimmy before turning over his left for a fadeaway in that direction. And when turning over either shoulder into a jumper, he's also a threat to up fake and set up one of his signature step throughs. This isn't a high volume play for him, averaging just 1.3 points a game in the post, but he'll go to it on occasion, especially to punish mismatches. And whenever he does, it once again leads to amazing offense, in the 91st percentile at 1.27 points per possession. Just like out in space, defenses can't just leave someone that effective in single coverage, and as soon as a double comes, it's right back to that low error passing. So, just to quickly recap, he's in the 90th percentile in ISO efficiency, 91st in post-ups, and 94th in pick and roll. I don't think I need to explain how absurd that is. He's one of the best on-ball scorers we've seen in a very long time, worthy of being mentioned next to names like James Harden, Luka Doncic, and many others. But here's what's interesting, he only averages 72 touches a game. 
That might sound like a lot, but in comparison to typical heliocentric stars who get up to 90 or 100, he still spends quite a bit of time away from the ball. In these spots, he's not running around, not cutting much, typically you'll find him spotting up along the perimeter. This isn't for catch and shoot threes though, he only shoots one of those a game. What he's really looking to do is slash off the catch. Remember when I was talking about his ability to play in transition and how he's really good at quickly processing the defense? That stands out in these spots where he'll make a quick read, cut into multiple different lanes, and get right back to that rim for some automatic offense. It goes without saying that this guy's a pretty multi-layered scorer. Transition or half court, isolation or pick and roll, he's an incredible shot creator and shot maker. I also didn't even get into the fact that he's one of the best foul drawers in the NBA, attempting just under 9 free throws a game and converting 88% of the time. When that all comes together, you're left with someone who's averaging 31 points a game. And when I say averaging, I mean that's a consistent 31. He's not relying on hot shooting stretches, it's pretty much the most guaranteed thing in the league. Maybe that has something to do with the fact that he's also up to 65% true shooting. We're talking rare territory as a scorer. Then you add in the playmaking, lack of turnovers, and the fact that he can play off ball, and that's where the impact starts to reach new heights. This season, the Thunder have recorded an impressive 123.7 offensive rating with him on the floor, good for the 97th percentile among all players. And with him off the floor, that falls all the way to 112. Offensive impact alone would be enough to make him one of the best players in the NBA. But what about the other side of the ball? Shea actually spends most of his time on defense operating like a four. They'll throw him on a spot up shooter in the corner and he'll freely roam the weak side as a helper. I really like that he's not afraid to be aggressive or take risks with his rotations, and he has incredible timing. Notice how he waits until Davis starts focusing on the pass before coming over, allowing him to completely blindside the big man. Here's another one where he's just patiently waiting on that weak side block, and as soon as Mitchell starts his attack, he slides down to meet him vertically and picks up a rejection. He's one of the game's best rim protecting guards due to a unique combination of timing, quick vertical pop, and of course, most importantly, that length. Those long arms also help him just eat up space on the court. What I mean by that is most guards would have to commit to the dunker spot here, but he's able to play in between both the big and a shooter in the corner and swipes into a dump off pass for a steal. Because he doesn't have to overcommit, he can help aggressively without giving up any advantages. Again, you see that in-between positioning. This time it's a kickout, and he's able to recover on a closeout and get a hand up. In general, Shea's instincts as a helper are just phenomenal. Again, you see that timing as he blindsides Brunson with the length and agility to of course get back to his man, and the Knicks end up with this shot from Josh Hart, not ideal. His length is especially tough for ball handlers to deal with in the middle of the floor like this. He slides down and makes himself wide to alter a driving lane, and when quickly gathers for a pass, well he takes that away too. Those plays are routine for him. He might just have the sharpest hands in the NBA, which when paired with the wingspan, help him make plays on the ball that don't seem possible. On this one, he never even leaves his man on the wing, and with this defender sliding down, Shengun thinks he has an easy pass to the corner. Not quite. Shea's averaging over 3.5 deflections a game, good for second in the NBA, just constantly disrupting offenses in passing lanes when helping, and making ball handlers think twice about dribbling near him. With that said, I think he can sometimes be too infatuated with making a play on the ball, which leads to lapses. On this one, he's the low man and gets ready to help, but forgets to watch his own man as he cuts right behind him for an easy lay. This time, he's on the wing, and while thinking about how he can help at the nail, again, his matchup slips back door for some easy offense. And here's another example where he just simply gets caught watching the ball as his man relocates from up top to the corner, leaving him with no way to recover on an open three. I think because of his high risk, high reward style of off ball D, you'll find these breakdowns a little more consistently than many other guards. But then again, those guys probably don't offer the same sort of rim protection and overall defensive playmaking that he does, so it's definitely still a net positive. 
As for his on-ball defense, I actually think you could argue this has been his biggest improvement as a player from last season. He has great hit mobility, meaning that when offensive players change directions, he can follow suit and stay in front of the ball. Here's an example against Harden. When he goes from right to left, Shea swivels his hips to cut him off, and then you have that length to smother the floater. That ability to stay in front of the ball goes perfectly with his core strength. A lot of offensive players will get cut off and throw a shoulder bump to create separation, and he can hold his position for a solid contest. Lower body strength and length is a devastating combo in isolation. He first slides in front of the ball, then Trent throws all of his momentum into him while coming to a stop, which he absorbs before getting a hand up to make it a tough mid-range jumper. Here's another example. Patrick Williams goes to the shoulder bump while stopping for a pull-up, and just look at this frame right here. Shea is completely planted on the ground while Williams is releasing his jumper, yet the end result is a block. Those two key traits, the length and strength, also give him some unique switchability, this time holding his ground against Tobias Harris and contesting his turnaround jumper. Now obviously, you won't just see him matching up with bigs and stonewalling them, that's not what I'm saying, but every now and then he'll have these possessions where his unique skill set allows him to operate like a big. On this one, he's matched up with 7-foot Markkanen, turns away his isolation, and forces the offense to reset before hanging around the paint so that he can protect the rim from a drive. Against more powerful wings and forwards who will operate out of the mid post, he's constantly looking for ways to pick their pockets. And that's if they're even able to get the ball to begin with, because throwing an entry pass near this guy is as difficult as it gets. I'd say that probably his biggest weakness as an on-ball defender is getting around screens. When he finds himself at the point of attack, he's prone to getting beat off the dribble. However, he mitigates some of that with the hands and length, going over the screen and searching for a poke from behind. Here's another example. A screen comes, he goes over and reaches, but fails to make a play on the ball, only to continue chasing and try again, this time getting the steal. It's not just off of screens where you'll see Shea make these types of recoveries. In isolation, Harden gets the step, so he just reaches in front of him and picks his pocket. Here's one that actually starts with him getting shifted pretty bad, and for most guards, that's it, only for him to send away an attempt at a floater. I can go on and on with examples of how disruptive he can be in rear pursuit. This time, it's a closeout where he gets beat, and from right here, it looks like Seth Curry has a free opportunity, just not when Shea's around. Those hands are such a nuisance, no matter what the offense is trying to do. On this one, he's chasing his man through a decoy handoff action, and decides to take a swipe at the ball, knocking it loose and gathering with a head of steam, which leads to some easy offense. The combination of deflections and on-ball pickpockets have Shea averaging over two steals a game, first in the NBA, and as we all know, forcing turnovers helps create high-quality opportunities on offense. Shea's averaging five points a game off turnovers, also first, by a pretty wide margin, which brings us in a complete circle right back to where we started with the transition game. So where does that leave him as an overall player? Well, for starters, impact metrics absolutely love this guy's defense, but I do wonder how much of that has to do with the box score. The deflections, steals, and shot blocking from a guard are all prone to drive those numbers forward, and while they do add value, can definitely be overstated. With that said, there are some non-box score factors that indicate great value. OKC's been a top 5 defense pretty much all season, and that's with him playing a key role as a helper, and of course having the on-ball chops needed to switch, or pick up different types of offensive players when duty calls. Also, that defense has been noticeably better whenever he's on the floor. A 112.2 defensive rating in his minutes, and 113 without him, and it's one of those things where he seems to be a pretty common denominator no matter who you throw next to him. Let's start with Chet, the primary rim protector. They've been great defensively with both on the floor, even better with just Shea, and slipping a couple points when it's just the rookie. What about Lou Dort, their go-to on-ball guy? Very good with both on the floor, even better with just Shea, and not exactly looking too good without him. Now obviously, these numbers can't just be taken at face value. No, the Thunder would not be better defensively if Shea exclusively played without those two guys. All I'm saying is that there's some consistency here. 
which means it's another indicator pointing to good things. If I had to evaluate his defense myself, I'd say he's a strong positive. Some of the lapses in judgment away from the ball, when paired with a lack of truly elite point of attack defense, definitely turns me away from treating him as a candidate to make an all defensive team, but the turnover generation, secondary rim protection, and overall versatility still bring value to a great defensive team. You pair strong positive defensive impact with everything I talked about on offense, and now we're talking about some serious value. This season, he's plus 530, third in the NBA, and only behind two Celtics players, while no other member of the Thunder even cracks the top 15. That's because whenever he's not on the floor, they just simply don't look nearly as good. In his minutes, they've been about plus 11.5 per 100 possessions, the level of a contender, and without him, they actually have been a net negative. That's the type of signal you expect from an MVP. Whether or not he's actually been the most valuable player this season, for right now I'll leave that for you to decide, and maybe in the near future I'll make a video specifically breaking down those cases. Either way, there's no denying the brilliance of Shea. The historic on-ball scoring, the playmaking, and of course the defense all work together in making him one of the very best players in the world. If you enjoyed this breakdown, make sure to drop a like, subscribe, and turn my post notifications on to be first on more content. If you're interested in my more in-depth research, make sure to check out my website and social media profiles. You can find those links in the description. Feel free to let me know down in the comments what you think of Shay. As always, I hope you all have a great day, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.